as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Probably ought to turn that on in case I wander. Destruction cometh upon you as a whirlwind. Um, then they, they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning of the way of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. I was the fool who turned away and it almost destroyed me. It's not knowledge calling out to you in this passage. It's wisdom. Just as an illustration of this whole concept, let's look at smoking. Once the medical profession figured out that smoking is hazardous to your health, they were like, oh, oh wow, this is dangerous. So they printed warning labels, and they put them on every single pack of cigarettes. Because they figured, if people only knew how dangerous this is, But obviously the wisdom or the knowledge does no good unless you have the wisdom to heed it. Because even though you see the destructive nature of smoking in people's lungs and in people's throats and in, in the de mass destruction it causes, people still smoke. Not only do people smoke, people with these diseases continue to smoke. Um, I've seen people on oxygen, and then they pull the oxygen away, and they, and they smoke. And, and I saw a guy that he had throat cancer, and he, was, he talked about a hole in his throat, and he would put the cigarette in the hole in his throat and suck it in because it's such a strong urge. I know what it feels like. I've been there. And you even see clearly the knowledge that smoking is bad for you. People just hate that knowledge because they would rather smoke. And even when you go to a hospital, you see the healthcare people who are treating these people out back smoking. So wisdom is knowing that it's bad for you and doing something about it for yourself, and knowledge is just knowing. You can hate the knowledge, and it doesn't do you any good. All right, let's go back to Psalm 1 here. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the sinner, but the way of the ungodly, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. This passage clearly illustrates there are two ways you can go with your life. You can walk with the Lord, which leads to abundant life and blessing, or we can walk with the ungodly, which leads to destruction. Or we can take our stand in the power of God, or we can take our stand with a sinner, the ungodly. Or we can set up our own throne and mock be our own God. I'm going to tell you about, well, first of all, we see an increasingly deeper involvement with sin in Psalm 1. The terms of the, the wicked get increasingly worse, ungodly, sinners, scornful. What does it look like to walk in the counsel of the ungodly? That's how I started. I walked in the end counsel of the ungodly. I took my advice 
from TV shows, from movie stars. I mean, who didn't want to be like John Wayne? You know, he could go in, drink five dozen whiskeys, still be totally sober and jump on his horse and punch some guy. And, and you know, he was strong. He was tough. I wanted to be like that. So I'll, a lot of times, just without thinking, we take our advice from the ungodly. Um, and it's just slowly, step by step. And then we take our stand on issues that are issues of sinners. And we set our feet, and we're like, I'm not going to move. But this isn't something you should be taking a stand on. It's an issue of sinners. Or then we just sit down, we set up our own throne, and we mock. We laugh at others. Oh, holier than now. Oh, aren't you something special? Who do you think you are? Step by step, Satan drags us lower and lower into sin. And not only Satan, sometimes our own lust and our own desires drag us into sin. No Christian just out of the blue decides to sit in the seat of the scornful. It involves a series of small choices, little compromises that don't seem like a big deal, but the next thing you know, you're sitting in the seat of the scornful. I'm going to tell you about a man whose delight was in the law of the Lord. A man who was passionate and deliberate about whatever he did. We'll call this man Tom. Tom was taught his main vocation in college where he poured all his energies into his studies. Not because he was a good student, because he was a horrible student. And he had to work harder than everybody else just to get it, just to get the grade, just to pass. And he, he sincerely wanted to learn. So Tom poured himself into his studies, and he, he squeaked by. He didn't do outstanding. He didn't do really bad. But Tom squeaked by, and he poured all his energies into his studies and into improving himself. Um... College was followed by two years of on-the-job training, where he quickly became known as a man who could be relied on to get the job done efficiently and precisely. Actually, the whole project that he was involved in was completed because of his mastery of his profession. He actually became quite prominent because of it. A few years after his on-the-job training, he was hired by a prominent school to teach his profession. During this time, he became aware of the fact that there was a whole population of people made in the image of God that his church would not minister to. So he decided at his own expense to teach those people God's word. He gave them the opportunity that no one else was willing to give them, and these people loved him dearly. This man wrote out a book of laws which he voluntarily committed himself to live by so that he could better live a life that was pleasing to God and upright before men. He stayed at the school teaching for 10 years, where his students considered him stiff and boring. He knew his material completely, but passing it on to others in a classroom setting was not a very effective way for him to teach others what he was so passionate about. Then something occurred where his specialty was needed. So he resigned from the school and began teaching men hands-on, actually doing what he knew so well, right alongside the men he was training. Tom was instantly loved by his students, and although he pushed his students harder than any other specialist in his field, his men would willingly do whatever he required of them. Tom and his men consistently outperformed other experts in the field, sometimes outperforming several other experts at the same time. His superiors came to rely on him to do the impossible, and until his accidental death caused by one of his students, Thomas Stonewall Jackson was one of the finest generals in the Confederate Army. Military students still study Stonewall Jackson's strategies and tactics to this day. Oh, and the people he taught God's word to were slaves. How can we be stone walls, unmoved by whatever the enemy throws at us, determined to not only know our calling, but practice it passionately, and to teach others by contagious example. The reason they called him Stonewall is because he had no fear of death in battle. Because he said, he told his men, I am as safe standing here with people shooting at me as I am in my own bed because my hand, my life is in the hand of God. 
And when it's my time to die, it's my time to die, whether I'm in bed or whether I'm standing here in the battlefield. And while he was talking, he raised his hand up like this. Boom, a bullet went through his hand. And he wrapped it in his handkerchief and continued to stand there and talk to his men. That's trusting the Lord. All right, back to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's taking your advice from the ungodly. The first step is to not pattern your life after those who reject God. Why is that not obvious? Oh, it is obvious, you say. Okay, so do me a favor. Let's be completely honest. How much time do you spend sitting in front of the TV or the computer compared to how much time you spend meditating on God's Word? Pay attention to what is being said on your radio station, even in the words of your favorite music. These things affect your thoughts and your actions more than you know. And Satan would like nothing more than for you to brush me off right now. Who do you think you are? You thinking of me. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil, so don't. The alternative to walking in the counsel of the ungodly is found in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? He did everything. You could do nothing. So walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That, that beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain seat. That is walking in the counsel of the ungodly. For in Christ dwelleth all the full, fullness of the Godhead bodily. It says rooted and built up in Christ and established in the faith. John, uh, in, in John chapter 15, Jesus tells us, that he is the vine, and his father is the vine dresser. And he said in verses 5 through 8, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it will come be done to you. Therein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. If you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ and a follower of Christ, you need to abide in the vine. The vine doesn't bear fruit. The branches bear fruit. Have you ever seen a branch on a grapevine loaded down with fruit, does the branch worry about breaking off? No, because the vine dresser is smart enough to make sure the branch grows around to support. You don't have to worry about the support. The vine dresser supplies the support. All you have to do is take the nutrient from the vine and stay attached to the vine and take the nutrients of the vine. You don't have to worry about the weeds growing underneath. The vine dresser Worries about the weeds growing underneath. When I was living in sin, I was focused on what everybody else was doing. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. If we weren't hypocrites, we wouldn't need the Word of God. We wouldn't need Jesus Christ to die on the cross and pay the price for our sins. We are sinners. We are a fallen race, and He has paid the price for us. So we need to be rooted in the vine. And if we are attached to the vine and receiving our nutrients from the vine and allowing the vine dresser to take care of us, we will bear much fruit. So, walk in him, rooted and built up in him. That's the way we walk, not in the counsel of the ungodly. The next phrase says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So step two, don't take your stand on the world side. What are you willing to fight for? Is it music? Is it politics? 
or is it the infallibility of God's holy word? I have known people who claim the name of Christ, who have backslid into sin, and when it became known, spent the rest of their life taking a stand defending their sin. Let's make our primary goal to saturate ourselves in the word of God and apply it to our lives so that it's obvious to all we meet that we belong to God. And if a loving Christian brother comes alongside and points out an area of sin in your life, don't get defensive. Don't go into the attack mode. Humble yourself before God and your friend and repent and ask for forgiveness. The alternative to taking your stand on the world side is found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. This is the armor of God. And it says, finally, my brother, be strong not in your own power. Sometimes when we read this, we think, yeah, I'm going to, ha, ha, draw my sword, ha, ha, take it on, come on. No, it's not, it's not fight me. It's, it's Hezekiah. When Assyria attacked Israel, and Hezekiah saw this vast horde of hundreds of thousands of Assyrian troops that just wiped out everybody, all the surrounding nations around him. And, and the Rabshakeh, or the general, sent a letter saying, where were the gods of all these other people to save them from us? They could not save them, and your God cannot save you. Who do you think your God is? He attacked the Lord God. And Hezekiah took those letters, and he took them into the temple, and he laid them out. And he said, oh, God. That was strong in the armor. He laid that challenge out before God. And he says, oh, Lord God, you are mighty. You are powerful. You can deliver us. He had to do nothing. He didn't muster the army. He didn't like a battle plan. He just laid it out before God. The next morning, 185,000 Assyrians lie dead on the ground. God took care of it. That is how we are to stand strong in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Can you fight the devil? No, but Jesus Christ can, and he already did. You don't have to do it all over again. Many times we're fighting and struggling and fighting and struggling. All we have to do is let go. He already did it for us. If you struggle with temptation and sin, I have. The best way, to see, your lust takes over every time. I've just got to have that cigarette. Or I've got to have that drink. Or I've got to have whatever. If you physically will not take it, you just say, and, and, and what I've done is I look myself in the mirror and I say, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in the Lord's way. And I look myself right in the eye in the mirror. And if I'm a good man, I will not reach out and take what I shouldn't have. And that's how, that's one of the ways that I got rid of all that stuff. God just took the urge away from me because I wouldn't reach out and take it. If you won't reach out and take it, it won't give you a problem. I know that sometimes the temptation can be extremely strong. I've struggled with that. But be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. If there's anything you're ashamed of, just give it to God. Let go. Do absolutely nothing to reach out and take it back. Just let it go. And he will take it. He will deal with it. And if you need something else in its place, which you do, start memorizing Scripture. And if you keep quoting Scripture over and over again, or... Um, what I do is when I'm driving around in my truck, I say, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son, 
to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away. His wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross. My sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it's finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I can't give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have made my ransom. That is great. If, if you could memorize one song with great theology, that would be the one. When you think about what he's done for you, his wounds have paid your ransom. He has set you free. The chains have fallen off. You're free. Many times, how much time do you spend in the week picking up those heavy chains and wrapping them back around yourself? He set you free. Well, let him go. If you don't pick up the chains and wrap them back around yourself, the lock is broke. If you don't pick them up and waste all your time picking them up, if you refuse to pick that sin back up again, you can walk away. Blessed is a man walketh not in the counsel of the God, nor stands in the path of sinners. Don't take your stand in the path of the sinners. You need a bigger pulpit. All right. <laughs> um, then finally, nor sitteth in the seat, well, not finally, but sitteth in the seat of the scornful. If you have gotten this far away from God, where you mock and laugh at God's messengers, there's still hope for you. If you are listening, and you might not be, maybe you ridicule your pastor every chance you get. Maybe you're ridiculing me right now. But just remember that God is the head of this church. And through his word and a lot of prayer, he calls the shots around here. I have been in the seat of the scornful, and it was my desire, like I told you, to tell the congregation publicly and rudely to leave me alone. But God can do what seems impossible. God controls eternity. My mind just cannot comprehend it. But God in heaven cares for me. God himself melted my heart of stone, and here I am today, not scorning, but exhorting. Come on alongside of me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God cares for you. Oh, the joy of serving Jesus. The psalmist has clearly told us to avoid walking in the way of the ungodly, standing in the way of sitter, sinners, and sitting in the seat of the scornful. So what should we do? Psalm 1 goes on to say, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Do you think the Bible is boring? I have read this thing through so many times I have lost count, and it has never been boring. And um, it is my firm belief that if you chose most any narrative from the Bible and made it into a feature-length movie, using modern movie technologies, it would be a blockbuster. It would be the most fantastic adventure you ever saw. Think about the fiery furnace, Jonah, the flood, Samson, the exodus, the conquest of Canaan, any of the judges, just to name a few. On top of the incredible content, the word is also alive and powerful. It can reach out and touch you. Many refuse to read it because of its ability to expose your inner feelings. People, don't, people hate to hear the word of God because it cuts them to the heart. It makes them feel guilty and exposed. You can read Moby Dick and never feel guilty and exposed. But God's word touches you deeply if you let it. If you want to grow and you honestly can't just sit down and read the Bible without getting bored, then promise God that you will develop the discipline 
to take a little bit at a time. Or when pastor preaches in church, before pastor starts preaching, sit down in your pew and sincerely ask God to erase any distractions from your brain. Don't think about lunch. Don't think about dinner. Don't think about what you're going to do tomorrow or the next event coming up. Think about, God, you have given pastor a message. And that is God has given pastor the message. And pastor gives it to you. So God is speaking to you through pastor. So what you do is say, God, take any distractions from me and speak to me today. Then, if at all possible, take notes while he's talking. And then, tomorrow morning, when you get up, get out your notes. Look up the scriptures. Write down every scripture he gave you. Look up all the scriptures and say, hmm, now what's the context of this? And read it through. And, oh, I see where he was going with that. I didn't get it when he said that. Now I understand. If you will... That gives you something to go by. If you will just get into the habit of every morning going through the scriptures, and why do you pray? You pray. See, right now, God is speaking to you through me. I don't know why he's using me, but he does. He picks this broken cup, you know, and he's got all these other nice cups. He picks the broken cup, and he gives you a gourmet meal out of the broken cup. I don't know why he does that, but his word is wonderful. And I'm willing to be used even though I'm broken. Um, but you, you just say, God is speaking to you through his word, through preaching, through Sunday school. God is speaking to you. In a, in a, in a relationship, is it just one person talking all the time? No, in a relationship, if, if Eric... We're hanging around the house all day, and I'd come in and I'd say, Hey, Eric, what's going on? Hey, Eric, I want you to do this. And, Hey, Eric, uh, when you do this, it would be nice if you did it this way. And I'm giving all this advice. Eric never speaks to me. If Eric never spoke to me, would we have a good relationship? No, that would be a bad relationship. But as a loving father and son relationship, I say, Hey, Eric. And he says, Hey, Dad. And we talk to each other. And, and he says, Well, I don't understand how this works. I say, well, I told you how this works the other day. Remember, we go through this, and we go through this, and we talk back and forth. And he says, yeah, but uh, so-and-so said this, and I, I don't, un- and we can talk back and forth. When, when, you, when God talks to you through his word, you need to talk back to him. Don't be rude. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. If, if I'm sitting in a truck driving down the road, and somebody cuts me off, my tendency is to go, what an idiot. Where'd you get your driver's license? Out of a cracker back, jack box? Okay, but wait a minute. I don't know what's going on in that person's life. That person is an eternal soul that needs a savior. So, hey, they cut me off. I just back off. I don't know where about it. Maybe I could say a little prayer for them. God, I don't know what's going on in that person's life, but touch their heart today. Why should I be angry? What good is it going to do me? What good is it going to do them? In all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will direct your path. Your delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Memorize scripture. Just memorize Bible verses. Even when I was living in sin, I remembered the Bible verses I had memorized when I was a kid. And uh, when I actually was struggling with giving up my sins, it was the Bible verses that I had memorized that got me through. And then Psalm 1 goes on to say, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind driveth away. The contrast between a well-rooted tree and chaff is remarkable. Maybe you've known Christians who seem to have a hard life the whole time you knew them. Nothing ever worked. Every time they were sick or maybe they died penniless or, or an accident took somebody away. Or, so 
how could they be prospering? Well, Jesus gave us an example of this. He told us in Luke 16, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He didn't say, let me teach you a parable. He said, there was a certain rich man. I think this guy really lived. And I think this beggar named Lazarus really lived. Which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The beggar, covered with sores, being licked by the dogs, was God's chosen child. So how could you say he was prospering? Because he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. He's still there. Several thousand years later, he's still in comfort. He's still in the glories of heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. It doesn't say the poor man was buried. The rich man died and was buried. I'm sure all his rich friends came out and they gave him a big, beautiful coffin and a nice, beautiful tomb. And people mourned for the rich man. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Lazarus was deeply rooted. The rich man was like chaff. Everything he trusted in blew away and amounted to nothing. What are you trusting in? When your time on earth is done, what will it amount to? This passage isn't measured in the world standard. This is measured in God's standards. Everything you do in life is preparing you for eternity. And God will hold you accountable for what you've done with the resources he has given you, including your time. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Also notice that the well-rooted tree bringeth forth fruit. What do you have to lay at Jesus' feet when you stand before him? God wants us to serve him willingly. He doesn't make you surrender his will. He asks you to. Won't you listen do you tell people, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? And you say, I'm going this way. But God was just telling you to go this way. But, hey, I'm, a, I'm Jesus, come on, we're following this way. Is he your follower or are you his? When God tells you to, something, to, to do something, you need to be in tune to his direction and do it. He wants us to serve him, not your own self. He wants to serve him willingly. He doesn't make you. He asks you to. Won't you listen? Won't you dedicate the rest of your time here on this earth to serve him with your whole heart and life? He deserves your best. Make an impact for Jesus Christ. You may be the only Christian your family and acquaintances ever meet. How will they know about God's plan for their life unless they see Jesus in you? Are, we, are you willing to take your stand for something we're standing for? A life that is lived fully for Jesus Christ is a life truly lived to the fullest. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the truth of your word. I thank you for your incredible power and its effect on people's lives. And I just pray that each one of us here would surrender to, to the leading of your Holy Spirit and would, um, you would use each one of us greatly for your honor and glory in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Now everybody else is going to mess up and start calling you Paul. <clears throat>
I can't say that too many times and look at you or else I'll mess up your name again the next time. But uh, what a challenge. And, you know, especially when you consider the, the, what God says about uh, the temperatures of water. If you're hot, cold, or you're lukewarm, it's, it's polar. If you're warm, he's going to spit you out of his mouth. He doesn't like the when we're in between. He sees it as either you're for me or you're against me. Which one are you going to be? And, uh, you know, that's what he would say if he were standing here. But, uh, you know, what a challenge. And we appreciate you guys coming, and we'll let you guys head out. And uh, if you'd like to talk to them and, and uh, greet them, get to know them a little bit better, they'll be out in the foyer for a little bit, I think. And uh, but why don't we pray, and, and, uh, and then we'll head out. Father, we just ask that you give us a good week, and we just ask that we would, um, uh, that we would follow the instruction that you've given us um, through your word in Psalm 1. We ask that we wouldn't use that, uh, or we would use that knowledge that you've given us. We would be wise. <clears throat> we wouldn't just allow it to be knowledge sitting in our, uh, in our brain, but it would flow from our brain to our hearts and that we would apply it to our lives. Ask that we would be more like you this week than what we were last week and ask that we would continue to grow in you, by you, and uh, for you. We ask that you would get the glory and we ask this all in Jesus' name.